In this episode of Detroit Performs, Detroit's historic gym, Greenfield Village, is featured as Liberty Craftworks takes center stage, featuring their three shops, pottery, glass blowing, and weaving. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, MGM Grand Detroit, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to Detroit Performs. I'm your host, DJ Oliver, and today we have a very unique show for you. We're in Greenfield Village at the Henry Ford, where time seems to stand still in the 19th and early 20th centuries. During this period, there was beautiful traditional art and then there was functional art that just happened to have beauty of its own. Functional art is where Liberty Craft Works comes into play. We'll take you to all the different shops at the Liberty Craft Works throughout the show. But first up, let's check in with Senior Program Manager of the Henry Ford, Tom Veritek, to show us what Greenfield Village and this area has to offer. Greenfield Village is, well, it's unique in historic venues. Uh, not only is it an outdoor museum, which there, those exist here and there, what we represent here is over 300 years of American history. Uh, that means you might si find a building from the 1600s or all the way up to the turn of the last century, even up to the 1930s, you'll find a Greenfield Village. Liberty Craft Works in particular though, you're really looking for a sweet spot in the late 1800s at a time when, well, medieval craftsmanship sort of transforms into uh, an industry where pottery, glass, tin reach outside of their immediate communities and are suddenly found uh, as a regional, even national business. This is sort of the industrial neighborhood of Greenfield Village and it really fits what Greenfield Village was intended to be and I think the best way to really talk about that is when talking about Henry Ford. Henry Ford is a guy who was the chief engineer for the local power company, he worked on steam engines, he, he knew where stuff came from. Ford had a moment when he was 19, he took apart his neighbor's steam engine and put it back together again and the machine worked. And he said, you know what, when I got a hold of that machine, I got a hold of myself. I learned more in that moment than years of textbooks. So he set up Greenfield Village as a place where people can interact with history, actually touch history. Liberty Craftworks tells the story of where things come from. Sometimes this generation and even future ones are getting a little further and further away from actually making things and actually seeing how things are made. You know, stuff just doesn't come from the store. It comes from people's talent, their hard work, their vision, and their design. And we demonstrate that here every day, whether it's in tin, pottery, glass, there are daily demonstrations to see how things are made and even a few hands-on opportunities so you can try it yourself. Our year-round operational shops are the pottery shop and our glass shop. Uh, they have full-time employees and they make up to over 10,000 items a year in each of those shops uh, and we actually sell those in the stores. Now another shop that also supplies the stores to a certain extent is our tin shop. So they're, they're go ahead, they're, they're producing stuff but we don't have the year-round full-time staff that we have in the other shops. We also have a print shop, a weaving shop, and we also have a series of mills. What's really cool is not only are there buildings and processes centered around this mill pond that's behind me, there is a community of artists that contribute not only their hard work but their talent and their vision to what they're doing and with that comes an amazing passion towards what they're doing. Um, one of the really cool things I think for an artisan here in Liberty Craftworks is since we do show production pottery and production glass, production tin, very few places are doing that. And what I mean is that each item is exactly the same coming through just as it would be in a production shop 150 years ago. Greenfield Village represents 300 years of American history and it represents it in a way that, well, it's the sights, the sounds that represent that history. And I think a lot of people, whether they're here to hear a long historic lecture about something, read a label, well, sure, we've got that. We, we can tell those historic stories. But nothing compares to hearing the, the sputter of a Model T engine go by. Nothing compares to hearing the clip-clop of horse hooves or the smell of a fresh-baked apple pie coming out of a wood stove oven. Those are things that, well, like Henry once said, it, you can't learn out of a textbook. You have to be here, you have to experience, you have to be immersed into it. So again, whether it's seeing things being made, smelling them being made, 
uh, hearing it or just being in the environment, there is a sort of not only an educational quality, but I'd argue even a rejuvenating quality uh, to Greenfield Village. The shops at Liberty Craft Works utilize techniques that are in some cases centuries old. Next up, we head to the pottery shop, where beautiful plates, pots, crocks, and more are churned out every day. How are all of you? Good. Good. Welcome to the pottery shop. I think one of the most important things that we try to give people uh, when they come and visit the pottery is um, a sense for those traditional techniques that were done to create the pottery itself. So a potter started with this and he made or she made the shape. Then she passed it off to me and I sculpted the little uh, bird on the nest up at the top. And then I passed it off to uh, Anne, the other decorator here, and she uh, did all of this wonderful slip trailing. It shows another dimension of what it was like to live back then. Like people didn't have supermarkets, they were growing all their own food, they needed to preserve it for the winter so that they had enough to eat. And ceramic crocks and uh, bowls and that kind of thing were very important for that process. Particularly crocks, that was probably the single most important uh, piece that potters would have made back then. People could use that for pickling uh, vegetables, for salt curing meats. They often came with a couple of bands right around the top that you could use to attach a piece of cheesecloth to keep debris out of it. So everybody would have had uh, ceramic ware in their homes. The potter was a very important part of any community. It's become more of an art form you know, in the 20th century and the 21st century, so we kind of don't realize that at one time this was really an, actually a very important uh, service that potters provided. We're trying to convey the types of things that they would have made back then, and we're doing it in much the same way that they would have done. We do take advantage of some modern equipment. We've got electric wheels. We've got you know, natural gas fired kiln, which they wouldn't have had back then, also electric kilns. But what we're really trying to preserve is the type of ware that they would have made. You know, and if you guys feel the inside of these yellow plates, you can actually feel the carving that's been done in there. And that's going to be different from our other main uh, decorating technique. This is called slip trailing. There were a wealth of techniques used uh, in early American pottery. Of course, those first potters uh, were farmers. They were the early colonists coming over. And uh, they made a few pots on the side uh, for food storage, for, for just daily use. And uh, that was pr predominantly made out of redware. So it was a, a very easy to find clay. It was very low fire clay and they would use uh, techniques like slip trailing, which is using a liquid clay like a paint, or uh, they would use a technique called scraffito, which was a technique that uh, the German potters were, were using, where you uh, put a paper thin layer of slip over uh, a red clay piece, and then you carve through that slip in order to uh, make your design. Around 1800, of course, pottery shifted and uh, they all moved to stoneware, which had its own uh, processes. So we try to capture all of those processes and, uh, and not only present them to the public, but also demonstrate them live. And so if I pull up slowly with even pressure, then it just gets taller and taller. Yeah, it is pretty cool. Usually there's some sort of throwing being done or trimming or one of the finishing processes. There's always some sort of decoration to see. We uh, expanded the shop greatly in the past year, and in, in the process, we added this you know, kind of uh, glassed-in kiln area so you can get an idea of what the kilns look like that we use. And uh, often, we'll be loading or unloading. So there's a lot of different parts of the process that you can see. Often, I think people have the idea that it's only throwing on the wheel and that there's nothing else to it. So we give a more, uh, I guess, nuanced view of what that's all about. People are floored when we tell them that, you know, the, the process from pulling out a, a lump of raw clay until uh, you have a finished piece ready for sale is about 30 days. You know, and most of that time is waiting, of course, but it, yeah, it's a long uh, process. You know, it's not for the instant gratification crowd. You know, you've, you've got to be patient with it. About 90% of the work that we make goes to one of our gift shops or gets sold 
uh, through one of our catalogs. And we also supply many of the historical sites, uh, the two farms, uh, as well as uh, the Eagle Tavern restaurant. So if you eat there or visit one of those houses, you'll see our, our pottery in use. Right now we're working on items for our Christmas catalog, which comes out in October. It's uh, a whole range of things. We're working on you know, press molded plates, uh, salt glazed stoneware, pieces, you know, coffee mugs, crocks, all kinds of functional wear. And so it's fairly challenging. You know, it's many hundreds of pieces, so we have to really sort of you know, just dive in and get it done to produce things that people actually, I know they're going to buy them and use them and that they have uh, real grounding in history. I love the whole process. You know, it's just, it's a fascinating material to work with. One of the most popular attractions here at the Henry Ford is where I am now, the glass blowing shop. Must have something to do with the way the glass melts down into an almost honey-like consistency. I could watch this all day. Let's take a closer look. I got started in glass blowing through college. I went to the College for Creative Studies in downtown Detroit, and while I was there, I was kind of an undecided student and fell into a glass blowing class and changed my major right then and there. The spontaneity of the material really lends itself to the fluidity of being creative in the moment. And that's what really drew me into working with glass. What we do here is we create early American historical recreations. And what we do is we'll pull from our collection of early American uh, glassware and we will take it and reproduce it for the visiting public. You can make glass that is an art or glass that is functional. And so it really relies on the artist's you know, skill and the artist's you know, conceptual framework. We are here as our own artists. You know, we are ourselves. This is what we do year-round, uh, full-time jobs. And we're here to convey the artistry of glass blowing and give people a sense of the history of it as well. Traditionally, it was uh, a very regimented factory setting. So you'd have teams of workers you know, creating glass at different benches, all working on the same piece. So one team would be starting it, one team would be finishing it, and you would be working full production nonstop. So what happened in the late 60s, early 70s was what's called the studio glass movement. And it was really the change in direction for private artists to get into glass making. And it became a smaller scale, working in private studios, making artwork more than just traditional functional work. What we're working on is what's called the lily pad pitcher. It's an early American design from uh, produced about 1835 to 1850 in New York. And it was traditionally one of the first uh, American designs that came truly from America. Historically, what would happen was the glass makers would come from other countries and they would bring with them their own designs. And so having a piece that was really reflective of the early American time period uh, made us really want to try to capture that essence. What we do is the same traditional techniques that really came about in 50 BC when the Phoenicians invented glass blowing. All the tools are pretty much exactly the same. They kind of got them right, right out of the box, but we will use the same traditional techniques, just modern technology to fuel our furnaces. The process of making glass starts with the melting of the silica sand. Once that is melted for about 24 hours, we'll take that and we will gather it out of the furnace at about 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. After that, we will take it and shape it, blow it, and then we will flip it around and do the finishing work on the open side. We work in teams of two generally. There's what is called a gaffer or the main glass blower and his assistant. And so what we'll do is the assistant will bring over additional portions of glass called gathers. And the gaffer will take those and manipulate them using the various tools. Within the process, it's not just glass blowing. That's what everyone thinks. You know, when they come here, they want to see us actually blowing into the blowpipe. And that is actually a small portion of what we do. 
The majority of it is based on using tools to manipulate the glass. Since the glass is so hot at 2,000 degrees, we can't touch it with our hands. So we use different tools. Um, there's jacks, there's diamond shears, tweezers, all these variety of tools that'll help us shape and manipulate the glass. Depending on the thickness of the material, uh, the glass will cool down anywhere from about 30 to 60 seconds to where we can no longer use it. It's still well over 1,000 degrees, but it's cold enough that we can't shape and manipulate it. So what we'll do is we'll put it back into a reheating furnace every so often to heat it back up, make it more malleable, and allow us to continue working. Depending on the complexity of the piece, we'll work anywhere from 15 minutes to over an hour. It makes it uh, very challenging. Um, the more years you do it, the, the more efficient you get at working, but in the beginning it becomes very difficult to manage your, your time well. And so, you know, you have to really be planning and thinking ahead. When we're completed uh, the glass blowing process, we will take it and we will break it off of the punty rod and we will uh, put it into one of our annealing ovens. It's basically a big electric kiln and it's set at 900 degrees. At the end of the day, we will run a computer program that will slowly cool it down about 50 degrees an hour. We've recently expanded our product line from not only historical recreations to more of contemporary designs that we have based on our uh, collection, but we've taken them and added more of a modern twist. Within this shop, we do have quite a, a range of uh, skill levels. So we have people who've been working with glass for close to 20 years, and people who've been working with glass for just a couple of years. I think that people, when they come here, they're generally uh, enthralled by the fact that they get to see a material that they're so used to seeing in their day-to-day -day life in a completely different state. So they're, they're amazed that the fact that on the end of a blowpipe, this molten material is actually glass. And constantly you can hear people amazed that we're cutting through it. You know, you're cutting glass with a pair of scissors. And so I think it's that, that concept that they don't really get to ever see the material that they're used to in a different state. I think it is important that we keep this tradition of handmade objects alive because for that fact that everything today is so mechanized, you, know, you can go to a store and get glasses that are made by machine for pennies on the dollar, but when you get a piece that is handmade by an artist, you really get to capture that moment when the artist was creating it. And I feel like that is what will never go away. People will always want that. Did you see how hot it gets? I was burning up. I had to get out of there and make my way over to the tin shop, where artists are carefully crafting mugs, hurricane candle holders, and more using all hand-powered tools. And next up, let's check out some upcoming events happening in and around this community. To discover more events in Greater Detroit, visit Ixity.com. I have reached the weaving shop, where the talented weavers are filled with fascinating historical knowledge regarding this craft. Here's Richard Jerrion to tell us all about it. I'm a mechanical engineer and I've been one for many years and I've been involved in some fabulous projects with, at Ford Motor Company. And uh, as an engineer, I was very interested in very fine, delicate structures 
and that's exactly what a textile is. And so it was a natural thing for me, and I started taking a class in a local weaving shop, and it just grew, and the interests grew, and it became a, an avocation, and eventually became this terminal disease that uh, I suffer from being a weaver. My wife would tell me that whenever I start talking about textiles, I get a different tone in my voice. When I start thinking about how these things are made, and the structures of them, and the history associated with them, and the people who used this equipment before we got here to use this equipment, it's, it's just an all-inspiring bit of history that just feels wonderful. We have a number of looms here in the weaving shop. Uh, down at the end, we have a colonial loom. That would have been the kind of loom that would have been used in a family's home. Uh, about a quarter of the people in New England would have had a loom like that in their home. This loom, however, is a little more complex, and this is the kind of loom that would have been used by a craftsman in his weaving shop. Uh, the loom that we have here is a jacquard loom, also a craftsman's loom designed to make very complicated and decorative fabrics. While on the other side of the shop is a power loom. It's an electrically driven loom that was actually part of Henry Ford's Highland Park assembly plant. Woven fabric uh, is the interlacements of fibers. Uh, warp fibers and weft fibers interlace with each other and, and create a structure that you can make something out. What the loom does is it holds the threads uh, that you're going to be weaving nice and tight and straight. Uh, it gives you a way of raising some of them. Uh, and then you have a, a method of passing a, a thread across in between the ones that you've raised. And then you can return them and crisscross them. And now you've locked that thread in. So what you're doing is you're interlacing threads. You have threads that go one way, threads that go the other way, across them, and they interlock with each other to form a stable structure, which is your cloth. That's what the loom is, is facilitating as you step on the treadles and throw the shuttle. Well, we make uh, a couple of different things. Uh, right now, we have three different things on our looms. Uh, on the colonial loom, we're making a rug. It's a rag rug, and traditionally, uh, people would, cloth is really, takes a lot of work to make and you don't just throw it away. So if you're gonna make a, uh, clothing, you're gonna have scraps left over. So you take those scraps and cut them up into little strips and you weave them into a rug and it gets to be a very durable rug. So on that loom, we're making a carpet that's going to go into the Firestone uh, farmhouse. On uh, this loom behind me, we're making toweling. Uh, this is all cotton towels uh, and uh, they get used in the buildings in the village and they also get sold in the shops for people to take home with them. And on the jacquard loom, what we're weaving is a sample of the kind of pattern that would have been woven in a 19th century American bed coverlet. There is a machine at the top of the loom and its function is to pull on cords that subsequently raise the warp threads. And each one of those warp threads is attached to its own separate cord. Uh, and the machine reads the cards, it has hundreds of little pins that look for a hole, and each pin relates to one of the warp threads. So if it finds a hole, it lifts the warp, it causes the machine to lift the warp thread. If it finds a blank spot, then it lets the machine leave that thread down. So the cards and the holes in the card are controlling the switches in the lifting machine that raise it and lower the warp threads. It recognizes the fact that weaving in many, many cases is binary. And that concept was the new thing that was picked up by mathematicians uh, in, in England and here in the United States. And it expanded to begin the development of tabulating machines and computers. All started with a loom where somebody was trying to either raise a thread or lower a thread. Uh, it's a binary thinking that was so really critical to the development. This is, this is the foundation of so much of what we do today. I think it's very important for people to understand where they came from. History is critical to the future. You need to, you can't, you need to understand the basis for what you're doing and what you have been doing so that you can understand how to go forward and change things uh, for the better. Uh, these kinds of crafts are, represent not only the, the skills to do them, but also the mindset and the thought processes that go into thinking about how to do them. It's an art form because there are so many variables. Weaving is, is not simple. 
Uh, it requires a great deal of, of mental input. Uh, it's a creative process. You have to decide what the fabric is going to look like. Uh, and there are colors to be selected. There are patterns to be selected. There are structures uh, to be selected. And all of these things are almost infinitely variable. And you can create something that means something. Many people don't realize what it takes to make the cloth that goes into clothing that they wear and the other cloth the items that are part of their life. We try to show them how they're made. We try to show them how the technologies that came from these looms is, are relevant to them even today. The jacquard loom makes use of punched cards to control the loom. Those punched cards were developed in 1803, but they eventually became computer punch cards and they eventually became the binary kind of data storage that's in the cell phone that everybody's carrying around. So we try to connect this historical uh, information and these artifacts with their lives today so that they can get an appreciation of what they have and where it came from. Greenfield Village is a place that really does inspire people to do things. I mean, this place makes a difference. Uh, I see kids get turned on uh, by what they do here, and that's exciting to me and very satisfying. I have a friend who's a professor at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City, and she started her career as a 10-year-old walking into the front door of this weaving shop. It's the kind of place that makes a difference, and that's important to me. You mean to tell me a loom is responsible for a binary code? That is crazy. Just one more incredible thing I've learned today here at Greenfield Village. Well, that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. I'd like to thank Liberty Craft Works and the Henry Ford for having us out here today. You can learn more about Liberty Craft Works and all the artists you'll find here in Detroit Performs by visiting DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on upcoming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I am DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, MGM Grand Detroit, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.